The great civilization of ancient Egypt, with its dramatic spectacle and mystery, has always fascinated me. I've been traveling the country to explore some of the intriguing stories that have emerged from this historic land. In this program, I'm on the trail of a pharaoh's wife who committed a crime so terrible they tried to wipe her name from history. This is the body. He came to the throne in around 1184 BC, about 30 years after the death of his illustrious namesake, Ramesses II. He's considered by many to be the last of the truly great pharaohs, and he went to enormous lengths to ensure his achievements would be remembered. Many pharaohs left monuments in stone as witness to their greatness. They carved their life stories. Hidden for 3,000 years, these papyri tell a story that was never supposed to be remembered. And a place of refuge in time of trouble. I've come here to understand the two different sides of the life of Ramesses III. The public propaganda and the scandalous hidden story. Within these walls, a powerful drama was played out over 3,000 years ago. That completely changes how we think about this great pharaoh. Most successful pharaoh of all time. Here he is smiting his enemies, whipping them. Almost like a fertility god, a virility personified. But toward the end of his reign, Ramesses was beleaguered, beset few allies nearby. Civil disobedience undermined the stability of his reign. And also, he died in strange and mysterious circumstances. But you wouldn't know any of that from the images carved here. Ramesses ordered this to be one of the greatest pharaohs that ever lived. On the walls of the, uh, the second court of the temple are some very gory details celebrating. Severed penises, and there we see a hieroglyph for a severed enemy penis, I suppose. How about that? At the time of Ramesses III, he was fighting to save his country from invasion. ...of a naval battle in history. An amazing piece of work. In front of me here, one sees the swirl of a chaotic naval action. And here we see ships being boarded, grappling hooks, pulling ships over. An amazing image of violence, terror and fighting. Here is the image of the Pharaoh, Ramesses III, in all his power and glory. Gigantic figure dominating the scene with his great bow, he also seems to have been unusually proud of his harem of women. All pharaohs had many wives who lived in royal harems all over the country. But Ramesses clearly took particular delight in depicting himself with his women. I'm in the temple gatehouse and above me are the remains of a most extraordinary room. A prospect room where the pharaoh would sit enjoying the view to the Nile over there and the canal that once served the temple. But he sit up there 
with the young females, presumably females from the harem, which is somewhere over there, I think. We know that the pharaoh, sitting with a young girl, chucking her under the chin, conversing in a casual manner, and up there with another delightful female. These are almost unprecedented in Egyptian art, these scenes of the pharaoh with his concubines. Striking, but they have now a strange poignancy because we know it was a... ...of documents. In the early 19th century, a bundle of papyri dating from the reign of Ramesses III turned up in the... ...confusing and difficult to interpret. But piecing together the fragments, what has emerged is a story so scandalous that the ancient Egyptians tried to wipe it from history. In fact, they almost succeeded, because this papyrus is the only evidence that these events ever took place. Each pharaoh had several harems in palaces and temples around the country sometimes adding up to hundreds of wives and concubines. But he would also have a travelling harem of his favourites that went everywhere with him. Within these various harems, there must have been quite a bit of jockeying for position amongst the women, hoping for favour for themselves and their offspring. The papyrus suggests that it was in this world of domestic and political intrigue that Ramesses III demonstrated his major failing, his inability to organise his private life. It appears that as his reign went on, this pharaoh, far from continuing the glorious traditions of his predecessors, was becoming a weak, indecisive man. Ramesses III was, it seems, a man who was unable to make decisions even very important decisions. All pharaohs had numerous wives, but each pharaoh would choose a great wife, and that was done for a very simple reason. It was a great wife who would give birth to the next pharaoh through her. We see up there an image with Ramesses to the left, and in front of him, slightly above, the great queen, but she hasn't been named. The cartouche in front of her we should bear her name in hieroglyphics, is blank. This indecision was terrible. It created chaos within the court that should be order and set up a potential succession crisis. The competition between these two royal wives, T and Isis, must have been fierce. T gave birth to a son called Pentawarit, which means son of the great female one. But I and when he finally made his decision, Ramesses did not choose T's son, Pentawarit. Instead, he chose Isis's son. And from the papyrus, we know that this decision was to have potentially fatal repercussions for the pharaoh. T was not the kind of woman to be passed over lightly. From the documents, it appears she soon began to plot her revenge and hatch an audacious plan to put her own son on the throne. It appears there were two parts to T's plot. The first was to murder her husband, Ramesses III. The second, to provoke an armed uprising, to prevent Isis's son from taking his rightful place as pharaoh. The papyrus tells us extraordinary details of who was involved in the plot. For a start, T recruited those closest to the pharaoh, the harem women. This is an exact replica of a portion of the papyrus. And here is T's name mentioned here. This tells us that she conspired with the head of the harem and with the women of the harem to insist. But the help of these powerful courtiers alone wouldn't be enough. T still had to convince key generals in the army to commit treason, to betray their pharaoh and join her plot. Harim women came from powerful families. They were closely related to high-ranking officials in the army and in politics. 
If the women of the harem could recruit enough important friends and relatives, then this conspiracy could be very dangerous for the pharaoh. But there's a curious part of this document that gives us an added insight into the general atmosphere of superstition that pervaded the court of Ramesses III. Ramesses was a great believer in the power of magic. In fact, most people in ancient Egypt accepted that magic could be used to affect the lives of the living for good or for ill. Although spells were thought to be the key to achieving the required result, sometimes the magic also involved administering narcotics. And we know from the papyrus that T and her co-conspirators used Ramesses' own spells to help death even to read the spells in the pharaoh's private library, let alone steal one and hand it over to the pharaoh's enemies to give them power over him. But this is what the papyrus says about one of the daring plotters. He began to make magic spells for hindering and terrifying, and to make people out of wax for enfeebling the limbs, and gave them into the hands of the head of the harem in order to hinder the guards. This wax figurine, the arm of course, and uh, navel, it's a little sort of um, twist of hair, I suppose taken from the person who would have been the subject of the spell. I don't know much about the person, other than seemingly was a, a man, with sort of genitals popping up here, made of wax, so one could, um, I suppose, stick pins in it if one didn't like the person. And on the back, this little recess, a bit of papyrus on which the spell is written, except it can't be read now, it's too fragile. A figure just like this, that the priest, one of which was aimed in guards around the daughters, could send into the, the land to raise rebellion. We know that by now, T had successfully recruited many key military leaders to her plot, including the command of the archers and army generals. But the conspirators would need to choose their moment carefully, and events were beginning to play into their hands. Now, he lose popularity amongst his subjects because of a series of disastrous problems. Civil unrest against the pharaoh began to mortuary temple, but also as a centre of local administration. And it's where food was stored. This is where their wages were. They came here to go to the warehouses over there to take their wages, to take their food. The reason why the food had not been handed out was because, ironically, Ramesses was storing up the grain for a big feast to celebrate the 30th anniversary of his glorious reign. But, in fact, his reign was becoming more and more troubled, and T and her co-conspirators must have been watching with interest. The discontent and insurrection, a difficult and dangerous place, tottering on the edge of chaos. This chaos would eventually provide the ideal conditions for an uprising against the pharaoh, and T's plan was ready to glide into action. The details are unclear, but it seems that T launched her plot during the next big festival held in Mednet Habu. And just three weeks later, Ramesses III was dead. This extraordinary story... ...on top of the first pylon, and from up here, get a very clear feel for the geography of Medneb Habu. Over there is the entrance gateway. And that's where the spells, possibly drugs, must have been used to incapacitate the guards. Behind me is the, the temple proper with its courtyards and second pylon. During the festival, this would have been packed with courtiers and guests, the perfect cover for T's plot. 
In front of a forensic investigation, this mummy will be dissected and analysed to tell us what happened to him. But as it stands, there's no conclusive evidence to prove the crime. What we don't know is how he died. His body has never been fully examined. The head's been x-rayed and we know it shows no trauma. He wasn't hit on the head, for example, but I suppose the most likely cause of death must be poison. The royal household would be full of potential poisons used in medicine, mandrake, poppies, morphine. All of those could have been introduced into the pharaoh's food or drink and, and it could have killed him. A good clue is that the, um, the chap responsible for the pharaoh's food and drink was listed amongst the plotters. One can't help but feel sad and poignant. Did he die a slow and lingering death at the hands of these harem women, the plotters from the palace? The last people he expected to turn on him. With the pharaoh out of the way, it was time to follow through on the military takeover of the country and put T's son, Pentawarid, on the throne. But there's one other papyrus that gives a crucial clue as to what actually happened next. This is a portion of the Harris Papyrus. It was the son of Isis, T's son, is not mentioned at all. That's very serious. His name is consigned to oblivion. He's utterly forgotten. Clearly, T's rebellion failed. We don't know why T's plot failed, but it was Isis's their ears and noses cut off. As for the conspirators, they were all sentenced to death. Most of the forms of capital punishment at the time were fairly horrible. One involved skewering people on a spike and leaving them to die. But because they were aristocrats, T, her son Pentawarit, and the other conspirators were given an easier option. They were allowed to commit suicide, which they did most probably with poison. After this, all mention of T and Pentawarit was chiselled from history. T has no tomb, no statue, engraving or wall painting. In fact, even though she was a pharaoh's wife, the only mention of her name anywhere is in the trial documents. Who would have thought, all those years ago, that such a fragile document, written on papyrus, not stone, would survive all these years and today tell us about these rather dark goings on. Go. Next time, I'm tracing the dramatic chain of events that brought the ancient Egyptian.